I thought I'd start our season with something of a risky choice, and I hope you'll bear with me. A basic introduction to the life and to the works of Richard Wagner. I say risky because I am, perhaps foolishly, uh, going to be addressing three different audiences at the same time. The primary audience might be the people new to Wagner. Perhaps some of you have tuned into our seven webinars over the course of this summer and are perhaps willing to give Wagner a chance. Increasing the Wagner audience is, after all, the primary goal of the Wagner Society. Second, I've been told that and reassured that even those of you who are loyal and regular members of the society might enjoy something of a what I'll call a, a refresher course on keeping straight the basics of Wagner's life and works. And third, I offer this as a punching bag uh, to the many members of the Wagner Society who know more about Wagner than I do. So I hope from that perspective that at the end of this talk, we can have a lively discussion and questions, comments, and corrections. I'm dividing this talk into two simple parts. First will be a sketch of the course of Wagner's life. And second, I'll focus on the operas, including one selection only from each of the 10 works, which still, uh, more than ever, constitute an indispensable core of the permanent operatic repertory. Well, the life of Richard Wagner is way beyond the realm of anything Hollywood could have dreamed, filled with crises, failures, rejections, scandals, miracles, and triumphs. We probably know more about Wagner than any other artist, partly because Wagner wrote so much about himself, but also because more has been written about Wagner than just about anybody. So let's go. Wagner was born in 1813 in Leipzig in the Kingdom of Saxony at the precise moment and in the exact place, actually within earshot of the guns, of the Battle of the Nations. This battle, which raged all around Leipzig for months, is the battle that brought an end to Napoleonic hegemony in Europe. Wagner was the ninth and last child born into the family of Karl Friedrich and Johanna Wagner. Friedrich was a clerk in the Leipzig police, and he died of typhus just six months after Richard's birth, as a result of the chaos and disease wrought by the Battle of the Nations. But soon after his death, Johanna carried baby Richard across the still dangerous battlefield, seeking a man named Ludwig Geyer, an artist and playwright who had lodged with the Wagners. Soon after, she married Geyer, and they added one child to the household, a little girl, Cecily. As Richard's other siblings were so much older than he, Richard never had close or playful relations with them. Little Cecily was virtually Richard's only playmate as a child. Richard himself was a shy and high-strung, plagued by nightmares and other nervous afflictions. Well into his adolescence, Richard used his stepfather's surname. So the man known to us as Richard Wagner was for 14 years called Wilhelm Geyer. There's still speculation as to Wagner's paternity. The general consensus today is that Geyer was the father. He died when Richard was only eight. So Wagner had lost two fathers before his ninth birthday and could never have been certain about his own paternity, a subject 
he wrote about only rarely, but with, about which we might speculate. Wagner also may have speculated that Geyer was part Jewish. This has in fact been disproven, but in any case, when he was 14, Richard took the legal surname Wagner. An impressive number of Rickard's siblings took to careers in music and the theater, some with genuine success. Anise, also called Johanna, actually sang the lead role of Elizabeth in the premiere of Tannhäuser in 1845. So it was natural that Wagner would fall in love with the world of the theater. And at 14, the same year he took the surname Wagner, he wrote a play called Leubald, a bloody melodrama based on the works of Shakespeare and Goethe. And the thought occurred to him that it might be set to music. And so Wagner began to dedicate himself to musical composition. Wagner essentially wasted several good opportunities for formal schooling. Already something of a dilettante, he abhorred formal classwork, and there were periods of prankishness and revelry. But because he was significantly self-taught, there have been misunderstandings about Wagner's uh, sophistication as a composer. Because of his lack of formal or conservatory training, it has sometime, sometimes been thought that his musical greatness was somehow natural or serendipitous. Nothing could be further from the truth. But to understand this, we'll pause to consider what I think are overriding aspects of Wagner's complex personality and character, which, taken together, set him apart from normal people. We should keep these in mind as we survey his, his struggles and faults and failures and triumphs. First, Wagner was possessed of a surpassing intelligence, which made him rather unsuited for instruction and frequently intolerant of lesser minds. Second, he was driven by a monumental will and ambition to succeed, even to dominate. Third, he possessed superabundant energy to learn and absorb and do whatever he needed to achieve his goals. And fourth, he was sustained by an almost unnatural self-confidence, even in the face of constant struggle and perhaps clinical depression. He had an unshakable belief that his outsized ambitions would inevitably succeed by doing things his way. So how do we account for Wagner's profound musicianship? Relative to other composers of greatness, he was indeed largely self-taught. He did possess an uncanny gift for reading a musical score. And he plunged into the study of all the great composers and also the not so great. Though he might later deny it, many of these had significant influences on him. But the works of Beethoven were the touchstones of Wagner's musical development. It might be claimed that it was Wagner, almost Wagner alone, who first came to a genuine comprehension of the late works of the master. For example, the late string quartets and the Ninth Symphony. There was a view in the 1830s that these were the works of a deaf, unbalanced, eccentric, and were incomprehensible. When he was 18, Wagner wrote out the entire score of the Ninth Symphony and then composed a piano transcription of the massive work, a feat almost unheard of at the time. Much later, in 1846, when he was Kapellmeister in Dresden, Wagner literally lifted the Ninth Symphony out of obscurity by insisting against substantial opposition on a major performance. 
Wagner wrote massive descriptive notes on the ninth, describing with keen insight how the ninth, almost like an opera, describes a dramatic odyssey of human crisis, liberation, and freedom. Wagner personally distributed these program notes all around Dresden. The performance was an enormous success, and this was a major step in securing the place of the Ninth Symphony in the musical heavens. I want to be entirely clear on this point of Wagner's musical education. No conservatory student could have worked half as hard as Wagner to absorb and master the elements, the details of musical craftsmanship. He once rented a textbook on composition from Friedrich Wieck. She, he was Clara Schumann's father. And by the way, Wagner never paid for it. The one time he realized he needed formal help in counterpoint and the feud, he turned to the accepted master at the University of Leipzig, Theodor Weinlich. After only six months, Weinlich cheerfully acknowledged that Wagner had learned all he could teach him. So Wagner's surpassing musical craftsmanship must not be likened to some natural gift, but to dedicated labors and total immersion. This gave him the musical context within which he would ultimately realize his artistic ambitions. But before him lay a long decade of hard work and equally hard knocks before he would find his musical voice as a composer of genius. In the 1830s, during his 20s, Wagner secured engagements in opera and concert houses in backwater German cities like Magdeburg, Würzburg, Königsberg, and Riga as stagehand, repetiteur, chorus master, and ultimately conductor, invaluable training in absorbing the operas and the symphonic music of masters from Bach to Beethoven, from Berlioz to Bellini. And during the 1830s, he also composed three operas, now generally seen as attempts to imitate popular opera styles of the day. Defain or the fairies in the German romantic style of Karl Maria von Weber, Das Liebesverbot or The Ban on Love, an Italianate comedy from Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, and Rienzi, a huge French grand opera. Although there's much good music in them, and we still search for signs of the future artist in them. These three works are rarely performed today. It was in Magdeburg that Wagner met and married the older actress, Minna Planner, a long, tempestuous, childless, and unsatisfying marriage that had ex exhausted itself long before her, before her death in 1866. In 1839, Richard and Minna and their dog fled both creditors and the Tsarist border police in Riga. And after a stormy sea voyage, they arrived in Paris, the glittering and unchallenged capital of the cultural world. Wagner carried with him the partially completed score of Rienzi and hoped for success, fame, and fortune. Instead, he was subjected to every kind of rejection and humiliation, including the most extreme poverty and even debtor's prison. As it can still be to its visitors, Paris was cruel and indifferent. But the king of French grand opera, Giacomo Meyerbeer, took a look at Rienzi and recommended it to the Dresden Opera. And against all odds, and because Dresden needed a French grand opera, 
it was accepted for performance. Wagner and Minna seized the opportunity, borrowing just enough money to pay for a third class coach to Dresden. And now Wagner was whistling a very different cultural tune. Having been rejected in France, Wagner now rejected France, Paris, and everything French. These would remain hostile inspiration for the rest of his life. And with his surpassing gift to rationalize, Wagner now claimed he was returning to his beloved native land, no longer a fragmented backwater, but the homeland of the holy German masters. During the premiere of Rienzi, Wagner was horrified to realize that the opera was way too long. The first act did not end until 10 o'clock, but people somehow liked it and stayed in their seats until well after midnight. And no one was more surprised than Wagner. In any case, and to his complete surprise, Rienzi was a huge hit, and Wagner, not quite 30 years old, was appointed Kapellmeister to the King of Saxony. The Flying Dutchman, composed in his final year in Paris, was premiered in Dresden immediately after Rienzi, but was a failure. Nevertheless, the Dutchman can be considered the emergence of Wagner on his own artistic terms. The two subsequent operas of the 1840s, while Wagner was in his 30s, Tannhäuser and Lohengrin, both based on epic poems of the German Middle Ages, gradually established Wagner's reputation, and not only in Germany. Today, these three operas are nothing less than the high watermark of German romantic opera. In the late 1840s, Wagner became increasingly frustrated by the mediocrity of the Dresden theater, its inadequate support of him and of his expanding artistic visions, and even his very sensible plans to improve the quality of the Dresden theater. In addition, he became increasingly caught up in politics, the growth of German nationalism, the spread of democratic liberalism, and the 1848 revolutions breaking out all over Europe. In 1849, still an employee of the Saxon king, Wagner took part in the Dresden Uprising, which included the burning of the Dresden Opera House. For his troubles, the Saxon government put a death sentence on his head, and Wagner escaped into exile in Zurich. Zurich was a crucial interlude in Wagner's artistic and philosophical life. For almost five years, from 1849 to 53, he composed no music at all, but completely reinvented his own artwork, his aesthetics, his philosophizing, and his craft. He did this under the influence of his insatiable appetite to read the Greek dramas, Shakespeare, the philosophers Feuerbach and Schopenhauer, German medieval epic poetry, and a host of other subjects. So Wagner immersed himself in an intense critique of German culture, music, drama, and what he considered to be the sorry state of all of them. And he wrote long, murky, very often brilliant essays on these subjects, converting it all into a plan for the very future of drama and music and nothing less than the reformation and redemption of German society itself through his own artwork, yet to be created. During these four years, he also decided on each of the seven operas he would compose one by one over the next 30 years. 
He articulated plans for his own opera house, dedicated to his works alone, and he laid out plans for a summer festival at which only his operas would be performed. Thousands and thousands of words, essays, letters, manifestos, dramatic sketches, and librettos. His plans were just audacious. They may rightly have been seen as the hopelessly, hopeless ravings of a madman, a man at the time without a country, without prospects, and without money. And yet they all came true. Wagner began composing again in 1853, beginning with a monumental four opera cycle, The Ring of the Nibelung. He had written the four librettos, more or less in, more or less in reverse order, between 1849 and 51. And now, from the first notes of Das Rheingold, he began to put his revolutionary musical and aesthetic theories into real practice. By 1857, he had completed Das Rheingold, Die Valkyrie, and most of Siegfried. But by then, a tremendous psychic upheaval had taken hold of within him. He was cosmically weary of constant financial struggles, of his marriage to Minna, and even of the Ring Project itself. Years of work remained with no realistic hope of it ever reaching the stage. So, fueled by melancholia, self-pity, artistic compulsion, and even a passionate relationship with Matilda Vesendon, the wife of his patron, he abandoned the ring to compose a simple love story, one with a small cast, which could be staged inexpensively. The result was the most consequential musical work since Beethoven, Tristan and Isolde, completed in 1859. But his struggles continued. For the next five years, Wagner wandered all over Europe, looking for money and success. His early operas were being performed, and his reputation grew as an avant-garde revolutionary. But composers had no copyrights, and he was paid trifling amounts, if at all. In 1861, Wagner returned to Paris still hoping for a success through a premier performance of Tristan in the imperial capital of Napoleon III. Instead, performances of Tannheiser were arranged, but these were sabotaged by the drunken swells of the so-called Jockey Club, one of the most infamous scandals in music history. And the frustrations continued. For example, the premiere of Tristan was attempted in Vienna in 1862, but after 77 rehearsals, was abandoned as both unplayable and unsingable. So already hopelessly in debt, Wagner borrowed more money and set out to create what he thought would be a simple comic opera to Meistersinger von Nuremberg which turned out to be just about the most monumental work in all music. A work that the great Paderewski would describe as the greatest work of genius ever achieved by any artist in any field of human endeavor. And so on May 4th, 1864, Wagner, now 51, was hiding from creditors in Stuttgart in almost suicidal despair at perhaps the low point of his life when an emissary of the new king of Bavaria walked into his hotel room, presented him with a golden ring, and told him that Ludwig II had determined to make Wagner's every wish come true. Wagner was in Munich the next day embracing the king as savior and muse due to Ludwig's 
lavish support. Tristan was premiered in Munich in 1865, De Meistersinger in 1868. Wagner's long estranged wife, Minna, died in 1866. He had long since developed a relationship with Franz Liszt's illegitimate daughter, Cosima. The immortal Liszt had long been Wagner's mentor, confidant, and greatest advocate. Cosima was the wife of Wagner's friend and companion, the celebrated conductor and pianist, Hans von Bülow. Only after Wagner and Cosima had three children out of wedlock, here they are with their oldest son, Siegfried, did von Bülow, shattered by the betrayal, agree to a divorce. Richard and Cosima were married in 1870, but so devoted was von Bülow to the greatness of Richard Wagner that he continued to collaborate, celebrate, promote, and conduct Wagner's works to the end of his life. With Ludwig's support, Wagner had dipped liberally into the Bavarian national treasury, arousing the wrath of the king's ministers. And when he lied to the king about his relationship with Cosima, there was yet another scandal, and the king was forced to send Wagner away. He and Cosima were provided a stately home at Tribschen on the shores of Lake Lucerne, the home today of the Wagner Museum. It was at Tribschen in 1867, after a hiatus of 11 years, that Wagner resumed the composition of Siegfried and the fourth and final ring opera, Gutter Dammerung, or The Twilight of the Gods, was completed seven years later in 1874. During these years, Wagner had also secured a site in the northern Bavarian town of Bayreuth for the festival theater he had dreamed about 20 years earlier. He traveled all over Germany in a physically debilitating effort to secure funds for its construction, including the establishment of many Wagner societies. By the way, there are today about 150 Wagner societies around the world, including ours here in Washington. But once again, Ludwig came to the rescue and the Feschbill House was completed. Largely designed by Wagner himself, it is still for its many innovations and its acoustics considered the finest opera house in the world. The festival itself and the first complete ring cycle were launched in Bayreuth in 1876. This was the very first of all summer music festivals and there's still a day, today a years long waiting list for tickets. So now at last, Wagner had reached preeminence, even dominance in European music, theater, and for that matter, the arts in general. The 1876 festival was attended by all the European elites, including the emperor of Brazil, and the composers, Bruckner, Grieg, Tchaikovsky, Liszt, Chabrier, and Saint-Saëns. Here we can see Wagner accepting the homage of Kaiser Wilhelm I. Looking on from the left are von Bülow, Liszt, and on the right, Wilhelm II, he of the withered arm and World War I. And still, <clears throat> in increasing bad health, Wagner labored on composing his final opera, Parsifal, first performed in the Festspiel House in 1882. Wagner died in his beloved Venice in 1883, exhausted, 
famous, rich, vilified, sick, and worshipped. This is the last photograph taken the night before he died. And so before leaving Wagner, the man, I'll turn to a subject which needs to be addressed. In the final years of his life, Wagner's anti-Semitism and racial gobbledygook took on their most vehement forms. I find these episodes unforgivable. But I will say that the subject is, well, complicated, and it is only fair here to mention that among his sins, we must note Wagner's many friendships with Jews, his army of Jewish admirers and supporters, his virtual adoption of the Jewish boy Karl Tausig, and of course his insistence that his most seemingly Christian work, Parsifal, could only be entrusted to the conductor Hermann Levy. But of all these many, many things, over many, many days that we could say <laughs> about Wagner's life, the single thing I'd like to you to take away from this little survey is this. Never at any time did Wagner allow himself to be defeated by countless failures and rejections. He never ceased trying, never compromised in engaging his gigantic intellect and revolutionary musical craftsmanship, leaving us with a priceless legacy of masterpieces. Well, there's the life of Wagner in about half an hour. As nearly irresistible as it is to talk about Wagner the man, I'm much more interested in talking about the operas and the music in them. So what I want to do now is to just touch on each of the 10 operas, illustrating at least some tiny flavor for them and making just a point or two about the way each contributed to the emergence of Wagner's evolving musical genius. The American composer Roger Sessions has said that Wagner's music between Rienzi to the Flying Dutchman is the broadest single step in the history of music. Try as I have over many years, I've never been able to adequately explain this leap from rather ordinary French grand opera to a work which, for all that it owes to the past, nevertheless signals an entirely new chapter in musical theater. I finally found this solution in the lecture by Jeffrey Swan, who pointed to Wagner's listening, really listening and comprehending, a performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony when he was in Paris. Well, The Flying Dutchman focuses on two people, the sea captain who for his blasphemy is condemned to roam the oceans until he finds a woman loyal until death so that he might find salvation. Notions of salvation, of the possibility of human redemption will figure in each of Wagner's great works. The Dutchman is built around many operatic conventions from the past, arias, duets, choruses. But here too is Wagner's first attempt to explore the inner psychological lives of his characters, including the redemptive power of woman. The point I want to illustrate here is that in The Flying Dutchman, Wagner begins to find his own musical voice. This is apparent from the first notes of the opera, intense, exciting music which paints a stirring picture of a turbulent seascape.
In 1844, Wagner in periodic bad health took a cure at the spa in Marienbad, where he immersed himself into the epic stories of medieval German literature, and especially the works of the Brothers Grimm. Wagner conflated two of these into a story about an outsider, a musical poet who faces choices between the sensual and the chaste, the sacred and the profane, but also convention and inspiration, issues which will be carried forward into the future music dramas. After the failure of the Flying Dutchman in Dresden, Wagner needed a popular success. And in some matters of style, Tannhäuser is a step back toward grand opera. How, however, Wagner's increasing skill as a musical craftsman is readily relevant. One aspect, only one aspect of which I want to illustrate now. Act two ends with a huge set piece for chorus and all of the main and secondary characters, each summing up the dramatic state of play so far. There's even the intervention of a heavenly chorus as Tannhäuser, chastised for his sins, determines to seek forgiveness from the Pope in Rome. This kind of complex, rousing conclusion was a common device in grand opera. The point I want to make is Wagner simply did it better than Meyerbeer or anyone else. And I think it's quite all right to be thrilled by the grandeur of it. In this production from Bayreuth, Tannhäuser is sung by Spash Venkoff and Elizabeth by Gwyneth Jones. <laughs>
next came Lohengrin, a story about a knight of the Holy Grail who saves a falsely accused woman, Elsa. This opera stands with Tannhäuser as the summit of high German romanticism. The only point I want to make here is how accomplished Wagner was at melody. Contrary to the cliches about Wagner writing being loud and clashing music or singers who bark, Wagner idolized Bellini and always insisted on beautiful, Italianate, nuanced singing. In this clip, it's a great irony that the innocent Elsa sings about the value of trust, while the malevolent pagan Ortrud relishes that she will betray Elsa's trust to destroy her. The singers from this production in Baden-Baden are Solvay Kringleborn and Waltraud Meyer. Here's one of the great melodies of the 19th century. A bit earlier, I emphasized Wagner's transformative artistic reorientation during his exile in Switzerland. In 1853, he began composing again, Der Ring des Nibelungen. By the way, all the ring excerpts in this talk are taken from the historic recording of George Scholte and the Vienna Philharmonic, 1858, 1958, to 1966. 
the beginning of Das Rheingold, the first ring up, is nothing less than a declaration of revolution in music beyond Romanticism and into the modern world. Audaciously, it describes the beginning of the world itself. First, a single note, a barely heard E flat in the deepest bass. To this, Wagner adds a second note as counterpoint, and then an arpeggiated major chord, the coming to life of the natural world, using eight French horns. The strings and wind instruments are added to elaborate a depiction of the Rhine River as the iconic aspect of nature. At the overwhelming climax, the curtain rises on the Rhine Daughters, playfully swimming around the gold at the bottom of the river. I might add that the prelude is all the more effective because it invokes two of Wagner's lasting innovations. He was the first to turn off the lights in the theater, now a common practice everywhere. And he designed the Bayreuth Theater so that the orchestra and conductor cannot be say, seen from the audience, whose attention is thereby directed solely to the stage. So imagine sitting in total darkness as the world itself comes to life.
while Wagner composed the second ring opera, Die Valkyrie, almost simultaneously with Das Rheingold. The Valkyrie has always been the most popular of the ring operas, especially for the Abschied, or Wotan's farewell to his daughter, Brunhilde. The glorious Brunhilde has disobeyed her powerful father, whom she's worshiped, casting aside the godly virtues of power and opting for the human values of love. He's consumed with rage at her betrayal and he condemns her to sleep in a ring of fire. This is not a story about gods and warrior maidens. It's about the tragedy of a powerful man trapped by his own frustration and anger, compelled to spite himself, to abandon the thing that he loves most in life, his daughter. Every father, every daughter can relate to this shattering experience, painted in a masterpiece of musical language. And it's fair to wonder how Wagner, supposedly such a terrible man, could reach so deep within himself into the profoundest reservoir of human understanding. Here is just a fragment of that scene as Wotan embraces Brunhilde for the last time. <laughs> The next opera, Siegfried, tells the story of the coming of age, of boy to man to hero. He forges the great sword Notung, and with it kills the dragon Fafner to secure the ring. The tenor is Wolfgang Wingassen. These actions are conventional labors of the emerging hero in any epic, but Wagner tells the story with humor and wry sympathy for the callow youth. In this way, the opera Siegfried is like the scherzo of the ring, like a dancing third movement in a four-part symphony. In this excerpt, Siegfried has dispatched his grandfather Wotan in combat and heads for the fiery mountaintop where the magnificent Brunhilde lies asleep, 
awaiting a hero who knows no fear. And here Wagner unmistakably anticipates the seminal discoveries of Freud and Jung and modern psychology itself. Siegfried first has to overcome his father figure, Wotan, and then moves on to the fearful encounter with sex. The passage we will hear is one of the great transitional pieces in the ring. Coming between these two memorable scenes, while the ring is filled with pains of human failure, it also reaches inspiring heights, such as this magnificent musical expression of triumph and hope. We noted earlier that in 1857, Wagner walked away from Siegfried and the ring for 11 years in order to compose a piece with a small cast and a simple story, which he thought could be inexpensively staged and would make money. It's Tristan and Isolde, and the world of music has never been the same. Tristan's special place in music history is its expansion of conventional tonality and harmony. Wagner creates a new harmonic language of increasing chromaticism, pushing conventional tonality and di diatonicism to the brink of perfection or exhaustion and toward the future. Leonard Bernstein considered Tristan the central work in music history, the hub of the wheel, the turning point after which music could never be the same. For people like Brahms and Mahler and Richard Strauss and countless other musicians, merely holding in their hands the 655 page orchestral score 
of Tristan and Isolde has been a virtually sacred act. The central musical idea of Tristan, from which a great deal of the music evolves, is the so-called Tristan chord, which is not a chord at all, but a musical phrase of just 14 notes. Musicologists are still arguing over its key structure. Here, Wagner is pushing to the edge a central premise of European music since the early 17th century. The idea of tension and release, of instability and resolution. In Tristan, Wagner holds on to this tension <laughs> for four hours until the very end. Here's the Tristan chord in just the first page of the prelude from a recording by Herbert von Karajan and the Berlin Philharmonic. You know, it's, it's really hard to play excerpts from Wagner because there are no places to stop and you just want to keep going, so forgive me. After Tristan, and in deepest personal despair, Wagner created Die Meistersinger a so-called comedy based on the historical guild of amateur songwriters of 16th century Nuremberg. One of the great themes of Meistersinger is an exploration of art itself, how art is created, respecting the virtues of the old, but making room for the inspiration of the new. In the first act, the guild members have been scandalized by the song of an outsider whose improvised singing has abused their strict rules of composition. Later that day, at dusk on a lovely midsummer's evening, the wise cobbler, Hans Sachs, sits at his workbench. He cannot get out of his head a haunting phrase 
from that improvised song he had heard that morning. It keeps coming back to him over and over. This scene is a wonderful example of Wagner's ability to make so much out of so little, to develop a simple eight note leitmotif in so many different ways. The music is perfectly blended with the words and the meaning of the text as Sachs ponders the nature of music itself. To illustrate, I'm going to show you the text. And I'm in the text, I place the number, the number one, everywhere the leitmotif occurs. The singer here is Dietrich Fischer Dieschkau.
After Meistersinger and with the support of Ken Ludwig, Wagner returned to the ring in 1868. The concluding opera, Goethe Dämmerung, or The Twilight of the Gods, is remarkable in many ways, but I'll mention just two. First, by now Wagner has moved decisively toward the primacy of the orchestra, rather than the singers, to achieve his musical and dramatic goals. Second, the leitmotifs in their hundreds of mutations pile up as an unprecedented device of narrative to remind us what has already happened, is happening now, and even what will happen. This is one of the richest orchestral tapestries in all music. And as the biographer Ernest Newman has said, the Gutter Damerang story would be perfectly clear to us if played by the orchestra alone. But more than just narrative, and by reminding us what we have already heard over the long course of the ring, Wagner is invoking the aesthetic power of time and memory. In the words of Jeffrey Swan, each moment in the ring is vital and radiant as the present because it is laden with a multitude of pasts and is pregnant with the future. In this excerpt, Siegfried narrates his story, how he grew up in the forest with Mima, forged the great sword, killed the dragon, came to understand the little forest woodbird, and found the ring. The orchestral leitmotifs remind us even more than Siegfried's words, all that we need to know. The tenor once again is Wolfgang Wingassen. <laughs> Well, Wagner had one more opera to compose after the ring, 
after the construction of the Feshbill House and after the ring's initial staging in 1876. This is the story of Parsifal and the epic journey of a pure fool who finds enlightenment through compassion. This excerpt features the tenor Siegfried Jerusalem in a Bayreuth production conducted by Horst Stein. We're going to hear what I think is the very moment of that complete enlightenment as Parsifal finally achieves an existential empathy, even identity, with the suffering of the woman, Kundry. Parsifal has just been anointed future leader, but it is only when his gaze turns to Kundry, and he sees her weeping, that he is blessed by the full measure of the grace of compassion. And in this moment of enlightenment, nature becomes its symbol as he gazes over the beautiful meadow when all the world is renewed. Debussy described the opera as the most beautiful edi ed edifice of sound ever raised to the eternal glory of music. Well, I hope you'll forgive me for covering so much, uh, so superficially, in so little time. Uh, for those of you who may be new to Wagner, we've covered, I hope, at least the outlines of Wagner's extraordinary life and the 10 irreplaceable operas that have survived him. For those of you who've been on this Wagner journey through the years, I hope I've at least provoked some reaction. And for those of us lucky enough to love the Wagner operas, we are eternally grateful for the inexhaustible and transcendent joy that they like only the very greatest works of art can provide. Well, now let's move on to your questions and comments. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much, Jim. Great seeing that again. Uh, so we can go ahead and move on to questions and 
comments. Uh, if you have questions and answers, you want to put that in the chat box, or you can go ahead and raise your hand, um, and we can start from there. So anyone who's got a question? I see we had um, some some sound issues, and I apologize. Uh, Jim and I tried to work on it, uh, and I, you know, our decision was to make things a little bit louder than softer. So I apologize. It was maybe a little bit loud for some of you. Uh, and Adrian Hoffman says, fantastic, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Anyone have to want to raise your hand? Um, all right. I think uh, Jim, so we have a question from William Harewood. What do you think of Richard Burton as Ricard Wagner? I lasted one hour, Bill Harewood. Well, it la the, the film lasted nine hours. Huh. Uh, I thought I thought it was too short. I, I love, you're talking about the Tony Palmer movie, an uh, extraordinary thing. I'll try to restrict my comment to Burton. He, it's, he looked silly when he was uh, at Kapellmeister in Dresden at age 30. <laughs> now, Burton was an old man, an older man at that time. Uh, I thought, like any secondary source. It, there were all kinds of liberties taken. I thought um, if you're going to pick an actor, why not Burton? I mean, he had the authority, uh, the good looks, the uh, commanding presence, uh, the uh, impertinence, uh, the intolerance of others, uh, all of which came out in, in the movie. I don't know who you'd get. <laughs> Alan Badel did it in the 40s, in, in the early 50s, in something called The Ring of Fire. Alan Badel was a legendary actor. Uh, the movie was Hollywood, but he, he really brought something, a seriousness uh, to the role. I don't know what you other guys uh, think, but I, I thought Burton, looking back, and it's now, what, 35 years uh, since Mrs. Holman and I first straight down to the, they showed it in the Field uh, uh, Museum of uh, of Natural History in Washington on four consecutive nights. Uh, we wish it had been five. So I thought he was great. Thank you, Jim. Um, David Dorsey, Hans Ricker, he says, the question was, Hans Richter Ricker conducted the Bayreuth premiere and Wagner had nothing but bad things to say about his Tempe. Why not conduct it himself? Well, that's a good question. I'm not sure physically he was able uh, to do that. I, it is a good question. Wagner was maybe the greatest conductor, one of them certainly. His treatise on, on conducting is still taught in every music school. Um, on the other hand, he was never satisfied. Uh, he was never satisfied with the stage productions. Parsifal came closest only because he was there three weeks. He, he demanded that all the singers and musicians show up on July 1st, 1882, knowing their parts perfectly, hopefully understanding the characters, which they did or couldn't. But he had over three weeks before the first performance on July, uh, June 23rd or July 23rd. Uh, to work with him. And he said at the end, you know, it was probably as good as I could have hoped for. Uh, others have said, you know, the problem with one problem with Wagner is you can never put on the stage uh, a, a stage production that can do justice to the work and particularly um, and, uh, to the totality of the work. Um, and, you know, why he didn't, I, I, but he didn't conduct a lot of his works. Uh, he left those to others. Of course, most famously, Hermann Levy in Parsifal. The great end story in Wagner brought his musical life to an end when Levy stumbled and was suffering from flu and uh, exhaustion at the end of the 16th performance of Parsifal, which is, there were only 16 performances and all of them were Parsifal in 1882, which was the, the second festival. And uh, in a moment, I can't imagine the emotion of, of everybody, but uh, Wagner went into the pit and took the baton from uh, 
Levy and conducted the, you know, that ravishing final scene. Interestingly, the, uh, the applause went on for an hour and a half and Wagner did not appear before the audience. He was hidden, of course, behind the cowling, but he stood uh, in front of the performers and the orchestra um, during an hour and a half ovation and expressed his great thanks uh, to them. Uh, but what a moment uh, in music history for members of an orchestra and singers to be uh, with Wagner as he brought his musical life uh, to a close. It's a good question. The Ring wasn't the only thing he didn't conduct. There were, there, he, he allowed that, uh, and I've mentioned Von Bulow, who was a celebrated conductor to uh, two other people. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute Suzanne. Legault, go ahead and unmute yourself, Suzanne, and um, go ahead and ask Jim to ask your, Jim your question. Hi, Suzanne. Hi. <laughs> Did you have a question, Suzanne? No, no, I just, you said unmute, so I obeyed. No, you, you raised your hand, so I thought you had a question, so sorry about oh, that. No, no but, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. All right, Jim, from uh, Mary Zoder, if you want to win over a person who says they don't like Wagner, which opera would you use to convince them of Wagner's greatness? I'm, I'm giving a, teaching a course on Parsifal, uh, four lectures, uh, an introduction and then one on each act. In a way, it's the most enigmatic uh, and mystical and of all the operas. And a woman came on and said, Wagner's an acquired taste. Well, I've spent my whole adult life trying to argue that it's not an acquired taste any more than Bach or Beethoven. <clears throat> we enjoy Bach and Beethoven, we can, at first listening. Now, that doesn't mean we comprehend the unbelievable, brilliant complexities, structures, harmonies, or parsing them, or understand the string quartets of Beethoven. I think, contrary to most people, you can take any Wagner opera and there are ravishing moments of beauty, perfectly understandable at first listening. And we get caught up in the tangled underwear of how complicated Wagner is, not complicated, how complex he is, that's, that's true the structure of Meistersinger. Uh, you, could, you could devote years to fully explaining the detailed structures and the overall architecture of the Meistersinger. But I mentioned Parsifal, it's in, on my mind, because there's, there, the prelude is a, is a very mysterious and enigmatic piece. It's perfectly understandable in musical terms the transformation music in act one, the Blumenmachen scene is charming as a piece of music could possibly be. Uh, the Holy Communion music is, is meant to be a tableau, a simple non-narrative picture of something over a sustained period of time, the opposite of narrative. Uh, and the whole third act, <laughs> Uh, the Good Friday music, uh, I mean, a six-year-old can understand and comprehend the beauty of the Good Friday music, not to mention the denouement of the final, of the final chorus and conclusion of the opera. So in a long opera, and they're long, and they are long, th there's music in every one of them that is readily understandable, and I would have no hesitation, given someone's desire to pay attention and listen and open their minds and open their hearts uh, to this music. Uh, I hope that's a kind of answer. That, that woman's comment has been rankling uh, with me and I've tried to th think of an answer to it. Um, 
everything's an acquired taste, but some, some things taste good right away. <laughs> and I, I think that's very much true in lots and lots of Wagner. I, I agree, and Jim, I was, I, I felt the same way when she said there during the performance, uh, the presentation, so I'm glad you, you address it and hope you address it next week. Um, Marilyn Gleistein, um, go ahead and unmute yourself, please, and go ahead and ask Jim a question. Oh, I just wanted to- uh, Hi, Marilyn. Hi, Jim. I wanted to say to Mary that when I, before I really understood Wagner, I, um, liked Meistersinger. And that was because I was reading the libretto carefully at the same time and I thought it was so modern in its psychology and so penetrating. And then the music, when you listen to the music, I don't think you can unlike the music. So if it happens to have been composed by Wagner, isn't that great? <laughs> to become, um, I think you can be won over by, uh, to Wagner by listening to Meistersinger. With the libretto, who could, who could, who could not? Uh, what musical novice couldn't understand the, the the outlines of the of the prelude de Meistersinger? Exactly. Anybody can can get it. <laughs> Anybody, and the whole what? opera spins out for, for hours, thankfully, and in incredible detail, with without forget psychology. Or forget the libretto. I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I, I, <laughs> I, I confess, I, I listen to Wagner a lot of the time without paying any attention to what the words are saying. For me, and that's for because my music. It's I have a musical orientation rather than a poetic one in my aesthetic feelings. No, but I yeah, agree with you. I, I, but I, I what, was what? thinking to answer Mary's question about a beginner. Um, sometimes beginners who aren't attuned to music can be won over by the storyline or by the characters. And Meister Singer has all of those qualities as well as the music. Anyway. Well, as you know, Mary, because <laughs> you, and I work, you and I work together on Meister Singer and, and I started out by agree, by quoting Paderewski who said it's the greatest, it's the greatest creation in all humankind and I said, he's understating it. So, <laughs> of course, I agree with you. <laughs> Thanks, Marilyn. Thank you, Marilyn. All right, Jim, we've got a uh, question from Wolfgang Porzig. Great presentation. Alex Ross just published a great book on Wagner. I watched, watched you on politics and prose. Could you please comment? Yeah, I, I said then, uh, and I, I'm reading it, I'm thinking about it a lot. Uh, I read a counter review in the New York uh, Review of Books by Jed Pearl, uh, and he takes a different, uh, he, he, he challenges Alex. I, I said then that I think Alex's book is the most important book about any aspect of Wagner of our generation. The key thing, and I think the key thing, and one might have to continue to tell oneself this, it's a book about Wagner's influence on non-musicians. Alex states that clearly in the book. It's not about Wagner. There's a lot about Wagner. It's not about Wagner's life, which I just <laughs> went through so quickly, although there's a lot in it. It's not about Wagner's philosophy although he, he traces back to Wagner's philosophizing and his ideas, because he has to, because that's where the people took up from there. Uh, but the book needs to be held to that Alex's standard. It's about Wagner's influences on non-musicians, and that means painters in the field of literature, uh, in politics, certainly, in aesthetics, in all the fields other than music. He doesn't talk about Wagner's influences in music. He says that's not what he's going to talk about in this book. I'm going to ask Alex to you know, take the next 10 years of his life to talk about Wagner's music. <clears throat> what Pearl quarrels with is this. Wagner was the most influential artist in the history of art. 
And it was an influence that can be seen, and Alex describes, it's 800 pages, not 650, it's 800 pages, and he cut it. <laughs> he cut out all kinds of material. But it's about what other, peop what other people did, what other people did. Um, and to some extent, or to what extent, they were influenced by Wagner. The question Pearl raises that he thinks Alex goes a little too far in saying that changes Wagner. This whole world, the Holocaust being, uh, it has to be the number one issue. It just has to be because it's the number one issue in our lives, in our century. <clears throat> but he says, People like me say, I, I, have, I find it incredibly easy to separate Wagner's operas and the quality of the music in them from anything that happened after Wagner died, whatever anybody said, whatever anybody did. I find it easy. There are a lot of people who can't and who don't or don't want to. Uh, ditto Wagner's personality, which is extraordinarily complex. I've tried to describe just the outlines of it and in the outlines of this life, which was so complicated, but so dedicated, so focused on creating what turned out to be seven or 10 of the hundred greatest works of humanity, or at least in European civilization, as we used to know it. Um, but I'm thrilled to have Alex's book, uh, and I and I I'm I'm going to interview Alex, and I'm going to bring up some of these questions uh, in January. I'm not going to stick to the book, which we did on the book party thing, which Anne Majet did. But I want to get back to uh, probing Alex a little bit more on how, if anything, Wagner's influence make us look differently if at all, or tremendously, at the works of art themselves. That's my quick comment on Wagnerism. Great. Thank you, Jim. Uh, got a great comment from uh, Wayne Blackman. It's always a pleasure. I know the opera well, but always profit from your perspective and come away feeling something new. So thank you, Wayne. Um, Dan Sherman. Okay, let me comment. Oh yeah. Let me just comment. I'm I'm still sheepish about this thing. Wayne, you be you probably one who knows more about Wagner than I do, um, and I tried to explain. I, I my primary audience. I'm trying to reach with people who are new and wanted to give Wagner a chance, and uh, I don't think there was much new in it. But uh, thank you for that nice comment. <laughs> thank you. Um, and for everyone, I did uh, in the chat box. I did post. Um, the Parsifal course that Jim is teaching now. So if you want to get some information on that, go ahead and click on that link and it will take you right to the page. Um, so keep them going. Uh, Dan Sherman asks, with so many great audio recordings out there, do, do you have a favorite conductor or favorite conductors? Also with the many DVDs now of various performances, do you have some favorites? This is from Dan Sherman. Uh <laughs> Hi, Dan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, musically, I would, I don't, it's hard for me to know one good conductor from another, or even good conducting. I know what I like, I guess. Uh, I, I like both recent Met uh, Parsifals, uh, which are available. There are many, many recordings now and videos available. Um, I went to the DMV, which I, uh, worse than going to a dentist uh, today in Haley, Idaho, to register a car. And of course, I took a copy of the title. And of course, the nice lady said, oh, I, we can't do this. We need the original. So <laughs> I said, I'm not going to let that bother me. Well, guess what was on Sirius Radio this afternoon was a 1982 recording with Mignon Dan of Parsifal, with Mignon Dan, my idol and great friend, Thomas Stewart, uh, Jerome Hines singing uh, Gernemans and uh, Peter Hoffman uh, singing the title role. And I said, 
uh, I'm not going to be upset at the DMV. Uh, I'm going to go to McDonald's and get a double cheeseburger and French fries and a milkshake, and I'm going to sit in the McDonald's parking lot and listen to James Levine conduct the end of Parsifal. And I did. And boy, the cheeseburgers tasted great. Uh, <laughs> but Le I think Levine, Levine had a sympathy. Uh, he obviously loved everything about Wagner. And there are many, many great Wagner conductors. But I think there was a, a confluence. Uh, Levine, to me, Tempe were always very slow, as if he, he loved the nuances in Wagner from measure to measure. And that's a wonderful way to look at Wagner. He's, we think of him as big. He's a miniaturist. Wagner was a miniaturist. You look at two measures together and, and the, the craftsmanship which was, with which he constructed them. And Levine always seemed to me in the ring to be squeezing <laughs> Wagner. <laughs> Uh, maybe Meister Singer, there was a great conductor who wrote about Meister Singer, it's like climbing a mountain. You can't keep going all the time. You have to find places uh, to calm down and to rest, to find the next summit and then the next summit. I think Parsifal by its nature and its nature in, as a tableau, there are so many scenes, uh, the opening scene, uh, Gurnemans in two pages, they do nothing but pray. The music is right out of the prelude and it's gorgeous. It's creating a mood. There's no, there's no narrative, there's nothing happens. Uh, the Holy Communion scene, they take communion, okay. I mean, we all know what that is, but there's no drama going on. Uh, and I think that's why, on the one hand, Parsifal's libretto is so weak compared to the others. I'm, I don't want to digress there. But I think Levine, uh, his, his relishing every moment of Parsifal, it's meant to be relished. It's meant to be unhurried. It's meant to be slow. Uh, and I'd love to elaborate on a point Brian McGee makes. It's it's you know, Schopenhauer's compassion and renunciation. Parsifal is renunciation in music. It's never driven. It isn't, it's not ambition. It happens. It is drawn out of the pit. It, 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 it's, it's, it's something that's not, a, seems to be not achieving anything, but it's achieving a great deal. That's a very long, answer. So I guess I would say Levine at the, Met at the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra at its best. And Parsifal. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to jump around with questions a little bit. Um, Rob Lucas asks, can you comment on how Wagner composed? Did he compose at the piano? Did he, did he make sketches? Did he keep a notebook of ideas? This is from Rob Lucas. Yeah, it's um, it, the first thing to say about Wagner and his composition is he never talked about it. He didn't talk about his music. He talked about everything else. He talked about what it means. He talked about philosophy. He talked about life. He talked about politics. He talked about, and he told everybody, every, he very rarely wrote anything about his music. He composed his orchestral scores sitting at a piano uh, with a pencil or a pen. They're incredibly neat compared to Beethoven, who you can see Beethoven struggling with a scratching out and writing something over. They're, they're very neat, I think, because of the gestation period. I think Wagner always started a story with a sound world. I, I, that sounds highfalutin, but I think it's true to a, to a considerable extent. There were some musical expressions, some, some, he did take some notes uh, on a phrase or a leitmotif, uh, but he wanted to create a world, uh, a certain world. And then he, the story, and then he'd write a sketch of the story. 
and then he'd write some of the um, you know vocal score music for piano expressing a lot of the ideas then he'd write the libretto and by the time he wrote the libretto uh, he was ready to completely articulate the musical world um, some people have argued that you know he wrote the libretti before the music well in a way that's you know to some extent that's true uh, but by the time he finished the, the librettos his musical ideas were were all um, pretty fixed uh, and then at the end he would elaborate into an orchestral score the last of which was in palermo of all places uh, for Parsifal in 1881. So it, it, it's an interesting um, method of, of creation. Uh, we wish he had talked more about that than some of the things he did write and talk about. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I was going back to the Alex Ross book, um, question from Morris Goldings. Alex Ross's new book, Wagnerism, was just somewhat nastily reviewed by Jer Jed Pearl in the New York uh, Review of Books. And the big theme of the review is that Ross did not say enough about Wagner's effect on later music. Is that fair or would have Wagner given a damn if he in fact did not have so great an effect as say Beethoven? No. Uh... I don't think that's unfair. Uh, I think it is unfair. That comment that, that Alex should have written about Wagner's impact on music. He made it very clear he wasn't going to do that. He made it very clear he was wanted to talk about Wagner's influence on non-musicians. Now maybe it should have been. I hope his next book will be. Um, Wagner's impact was obviously tremendous. I'm not sure it was as strong as Beethoven's. Um, in a way, you know, you, you've got Mahler and Bruckner um, and Richard Strauss, the three great uh, composers in the German world after Wagner. And of course, you had Debussy, who might have been greater composer than any of them with his own com complex, I hate Wagner, I love Wagner. I won't, be, I won't be Wagner, but I can't help being Wagner. Um, and then uh, obviously Schoenberg, uh, who tipped everything down the slippery slope <laughs> uh, of uh, atonality and, and whatever you want to call it. Uh, so no, I, I think Jed Pearl, took issue with Alex on the back shadowing part uh, and, and his aesthetic argument or what seemed to Jed Pearl to be an aesthetic argument um, that, the, that the works themselves are nothing more than what we think they are. Well, there, nobody's been interpreted, reinterpreted more than Wagner for pretty obvious reasons once you start understanding the works. I'm way over on the other side as, as, a, as a neophyte, as a non-professional, uh, as just somebody who loves the music so much, to say those works, the notes are all there. You can't change the notes. Uh, nobody's had that chutzpah yet. You know, say, oh, I don't, they all end on a major chord. Let's end them on a minor chord. The notes are there in the score. The words are there in the score. What you see doesn't matter anymore. I mean, people, people take as much license as they want for better or worse. But I, I say the works of art are the works of art and they can't be altered. Um, and, but everything's a gray area. And I understand that you might not be able to look at uh, at some aspects of Wagner without putting it through your own filter, your own emotions. I mean, this is, this is what aesthetics is kind of all about. There are no right answers to that. But certainly for me, I say, I, it, you know, no matter what kind of man he was, no matter what kind of influences for good or ill or inspiration, 
inspiration for other artists like Willa Cather. Uh, we've got those 10 operas, <laughs> you know, and uh, we're, we'll have them forever. Uh, there isn't going to be any elimination of Wagner, disappearance of Wagner, like there have been for so many wonderful musicians in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries. Um, the Wagner's here to stay, thank God. I, Morris, I hope that addresses your question. Thanks, Jim. Uh, question from your good buddy, Guillermo. Impossible question. Which is your favorite Wagner opera and why? From Guillermo. Oh, I, that's an easy one, Guillermo. I'm sorry to disappoint you. A Meister Singer is my favorite, period. I think Meister Singer and Tristan, if you're going to write them, they can't be separated. They're, they're in some ways totally different. Um, there are times when Guillermo, you, you go back to Parsifal or you go back, even to Tannhäuser, I'm especially fond of Lohengrin. Um, the least is the Dutchman for pretty obvious reasons. But for me, uh, there's, there's truth in a almost uh, spiritual way for me uh, in, in this music and in the music of many other people, but especially Wagner. And I have to say, uh, especially um, Meistersinger. Uh, it's, it's awe inspiring when you start to dig beneath it and see the nuances and see the relationships and see the continuities uh, in the bar form uh, throughout the opera. And, uh, and I, I think in its message, in a way it's the most heartbreaking of, uh, of all the operas. Uh, I think Wagner takes in both Wotan and Hans Sachs, he takes Schopenhauer's very pessimistic uh, view of our existential dilemma, meaning we suffer and because of longing, which can never be satisfied, uh, except in renunciation of Buddhist thought. Well, I find it much more congenial <laughs> that Wagner's found a happier, heartbreaking, heartbreaking, but happier, more noble end in that Wotan a failure and a, a bitter fool in many ways, uh, led down a path by his own greed and ambition, finally renounces himself and renounces the, his world and makes way. Uh, Hans Sachs in a much more prosaic way, but in a way much more human and much profounder. He really loves Ava, he really does, but he's older. Um, he's noble in the sense of understanding that Walter, who's unattractive, impetuous, prideful, a member of the aristocracy, uh, but he, he's noble, Sachs is noble enough to understand that Walter has a musical genius and it's the next step in music. It's better than the formula of the Nuremberg poets and singers. And he's a big enough man to step aside from Ava and present Ava ultimately to Walter. And also to show Nuremberg and the Meister singers that Walter's music wins the prize. So easy answer, Guillermo, try to come up with a hard one. <laughs> Thanks Guillermo, thanks Jim. Uh, it's a comment from Harriet Rogers. Just, just want to thank you for this presentation. All of the Wagner Society offerings have enlightened not only my knowledge, but the numerous hours we are all now being forced to spend indoors. That's from Harriet Rogers. Well, I wanna to say to Harriet, um, and I, I think you'll know what I mean, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's uh, humbling, not just the way you've supported the Wagner Society and, and uh, we're so happy to have provided you with some uh, pleasure and we hope to keep doing it. So thank you, Harriet.
Thanks, Jim. Steve Schaefer uh, from Wake Forest, North Carolina. I agree that Wagner is not a choir taste. He grabbed me in high school with the prelude to Act Three of Lohengrin. But do you think we could expand the audience and perhaps do justice to his desired staging effects if someone did movies with modern production techniques and computer graphics, clearly a loss of the live production, but worth a compromise? It's from Steve Schaefer. Sure, I, you know, I think our job uh, at the Wagner Society is to enlarge the audience and deepen it. Um, that's why we have a Wagner Society, beyond the fact we have a lot of fun and, and we have a lot of enjoyment uh, with the operas. Uh, I'm kind of a pessimist on, um, you know, not, I hope a realist. I, I've always thought that out of a hundred people or two people or who are going to relish high culture, there might be three of them or four, you know, as a percent. I don't know what it is. Uh, maybe it, in whether it's in literature and poetry or painting or dance or, or music. Um, People try, keep trying to reach for a young audience. I, there's not going to be a young audience for Wagner. There'll be that one out of a hundred who will hear something, uh, the, the prelude to the third act of Lohengrin, maybe in a Marx, Marx Brothers at the Circus, which it does uh, end that way in that music. But yeah, uh, uh, Wagner moments will keep coming to a certain amount of people. Um, you, you've, you've touched on a much broader subject was how does opera survive? The Metropolitan Opera has lost $150 million uh, and canceled the rest of the year uh, yesterday. Um, if movies can do it, I'm, you know, I'm all for it. Uh, we can do anything with movies. People have often said, what if Spielberg uh, did a ring? Would anybody go? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people would go. Um, I just, I think, you know, they're, they're just going to be most of society and most older people like, like me, uh, who on the one hand are old enough to get the deeper meaning in Wagner as we age. And, uh, you know, I, on the other hand, I'm, I don't think our culture, such as it is, our popular culture is much worse than it's been. People have been um, predicting the end of high culture forever. And uh, I'm not a big fan of MTV and popular music, and, and, but that's me, and, <clears throat> but a lot of people are, and they'll always be us. And so our job is just to keep it going, keep trying and pick up a member here and pick up a member there and bring them in and, and uh, hopefully create this demand. But as I said, I'll say on a final note of optimism, Wagner's gonna be here forever, one way or another, because, because it's so good and, and so many people understand that it's good. And that's not just an audience, but musicians and intendants and, uh, I, I think we're seeing more Wagner, forget COVID for a moment, but I think we're seeing more Wagner now, my guess is, than, than ever. Certainly a lot more rings uh, than there were when the two generations ago. So I don't know the answer to your question, but that's, that's kind of my reaction to it. Thank you, Jim. William uh, Harwood, I loved your book explaining the motifs in the ring, especially in comparing the analysis compared with Newman Doington and Cook, I used it to mark up my Breitkopf and Hartel scores. Why did you prefer Shermer? I'm a horn player and playing all the operas has been a great pandemic project. Thanks for your help. William Harris. Well, I'm not a musician. I'm not a musician. Um, I, I immersed myself in the ring uh, in the early 60s. Uh, I, I was a university student then, and I had a pair of headphones and a record player <clears throat> and the Schulte recording. <coughs> Excuse me. And I read a little bit, and um, 
I found the vocal scores, I'm not sophisticated enough to read an orchestral score, but the Clinworth, uh, Carl Clinworth did the vocal scores uh, while Wagner was still alive. Now, I think he did a, a wonderful job. And, uh, and uh, so that's why uh, people ask me, what's my favorite ring? And I say, Schulte in a dark room, with headphones and a vocal score. That's my favorite ring. And then I can use my mind to see what that music and those words uh, make me see. Great. Thank you, Jim. Um, from Lewis Kemp Pangaro, if the music is more important than the singing, do we still think it should be considered, should be called opera rather than Gesamtkunst work? Well, there are two parts. In, <laughs> these are all just my opinions, guys. You know as much about this as I do. I never believed in Gesamtkunst work. Uh, and Wagner, uh, and Alex, by the way, Ross says this, gave up the notion. It was 1848, 49, he mentioned it. Well, the Wagner operas aren't, uh, there's no dancing. Excuse me, there's no dancing, uh, except for the, the uh, Blumen Machen. Uh, there's no painting. Uh, Wagner could care less about the scenery. <clears throat> he didn't want costumes to get in the way. He cared tremendously about the text and that people understand the text. He called them poems. So there's poetry. Uh, and you can't, you can't sing Wagner without understanding deeply understanding. You can't sing it well without deeply understanding what that character is thinking, what that character is all about. Uh, and then there's the music is the primacy. Let's not kid ourselves. We don't listen to Wagner because he wrote essays or uh, was a good conductor or wrote, you know, long librettos. We listen to him for the music. But you can see clearly in in his work and that's why i picked goethe dameron uh because as, as as ernest newman said you could you could uh you just have the, the orchestra playing its part of goethe dameron and you'd know exactly what was happening uh all the time um so did i did i leave out a part of that question uh I mentioned Gesamtkunstwerk, um, but no, I, I, I'm not saying he doesn't want singing. Oh, yeah, operas versus music dramas. I think it's a technical thing. Uh, I get it. I said it today <clears throat> with the Rheingold and the, on those seven operas at the end, these what I call the transcendental masterpieces. These are very different than the transitional works of the high German Romanticism of a, a Dutchman, Tannhäuser, and Lundgren. I don't care if you call Tristan an opera, it is an opera. It's, it's, the, it's an orchestra and people singing on a stage in an opera house. <laughs> That's an opera. <laughs> so, you know, if you, if you want to go to the next stage and say, those are music dramas, I get that. Um, there are other words having to do with symphonic music that, that might be even more applicable to them than, um, than music dramas. Uh, but at the, at the easiest level, who cares? I mean, I, I don't. So, um, but I do think Gesamtetzwerk is an overused uh, and misleading term. Thank you, Jim. I have a question from Barbu Damien. Damien. Wagner the musician and Wagner the man. Absolutely extraordinary and very questionable to put it mildly. You seem to be able to take the good, forget what we better for, forget what we better forget. I'm wrestling with duality. How do you do it? Because uh, I weigh them one against the other. Uh, I said, and, and uh, on the issue of anti-Semitism, even more race, racial purity, the Gabano, inequality of the races. <clears throat> I think Wagner's embrace uh, his audacious uh, act of 
republishing uh, Jewishness in music with his own name to it later in life uh, are unforgivable. Unforgivable. Uh, and I don't think they're without some influence. Uh, you can't draw a line, a very straight line between Wagner and Hitler. <laughs> there are a few obstacles in the way. Uh, like World War I, okay, uh, which made World War II inevitable. Um, that was a much bigger event than Hitler going to see Rienzi in 1906 and saying, now I understand the German people. Um, I'm not an apologist at all for Wagner the man. I think he, I think Saul Lilienstein uh, summarized it better than anybody. He said he was a very great man with great faults and full stop. Uh, you know, I, maybe they were greater than Beethoven's faults. Maybe Schubert uh, <laughs> was a pedophile or not. Maybe he died of syphilis or not. Uh, that's not what we think about when we listen to Schubert's music. He takes us to heaven. He's on the highest pedestal <clears throat> in the pantheon of immortal musicians. We don't, nobody talks about Schubert. <laughs> What a terrible man he was. Mozart, you know, uh, Salieri, Mozart. Mozart was kind of an idiot. Well, no, he wasn't. Uh, even more, uh, Bach. Uh, we just don't know a lot about Bach, I don't think, uh, or what kind of a person he was, but every note he wrote, every note is immortal. Uh, I said, I wrote that once in an article, and I got really, I said, wouldn't it be better if we knew nothing about Wagner? We know more, way too much about Wagner. And it gets in the way. Wouldn't it be better if like Bach, we'd know nothing except the artwork? Uh, it's not going to happen. But I've, I've always found it very easy um, uh, and much easier than Alex Ross, whose mind is infinitely um, deeper <laughs> than mine, but I've always found it easy, maybe too easy. The opera is about suffering, every one of them. Every one of them takes us to an existential pain in living, <clears throat> and then offers a way out. Uh, I'm not saying Wagner was right about his values in life, or even what I just said, other people explain life very differently. I think for Wagner, everyone, every opera is about taking us down to the depths of uh, existential pain and suffering. And every one of them, every one of them ends in hope of a certain kind. Uh, a rather flawed kind in the Dutchman, who after all is totally self-absorbed. He, he, he never says the woman has to love him. He says she has to be loyal till death, to her death. He doesn't even say she has to love him. It's all about him. Uh, in Tannhäuser, Tannhäuser and Elizabeth both died, but look at the end of Tannhäuser, that extraordinary, this rather silly symbol of the Pope the staff of the Pope flowering, but the music uh, is filled with joy and hope. And I think Wagner felt we're better for it. I'm, one, I, in my first Parsifal, <clears throat> I know it's a long answer, but you asked it, I'm sorry. It's, um, in the introduction, I go to a little clip from the Royal Opera, from Gerald Finley, who is singing M. Fortas. And <clears throat> he says, maybe I'm naive, but I think, I think maybe what Wagner wanted was for people to come uh, to the theater, being exposed and being reminded of their pain, their problems, their suffering. And he wanted them to leave the theater 
feeling better. I mean, that's a very simple but very profound interpretation of Wagner. Every opera ends in, the major, in a major key, every one of them. Well, maybe Parsifal is the most explicit. As I said, we see he makes manifest the moment of redemption. And it's redemption is in every one. Redemption only comes from turning suffering into something positive. And that's, I think, true for all of them. And boy, that's a real simple-minded, and I'm simple-minded, but that's a real simple-minded simple way of why they, why they reach me and why they mean so much to me. Thanks, Jim. Got one last question from Carlton Eugene. <coughs> Thank you. Which opera composer since Wagner do you think is the most similar to him musically? How does Strauss compare to Wagner? Two part. Yeah, uh, I think you've got to go right to Richard Strauss in opera. Uh, the linkages are just too close. Uh, I'm a Strauss fan. I I love it. The Egyptian Helen. I don't think anybody likes that opera or listens to it. Um, Strauss is often characterized maybe because of his political life or his seeming life in Germany at, during the, the tragedy. Um, a little unfair. Uh, there's nothing in Strauss that reaches, uh, I can't say that, I shouldn't say that. There aren't a lot of things in Strauss that reach the depths and the profundity of Wagner. They're unbelievably wonderful music. Uh, there are deep moments in Strauss. Uh, the Marshall on in front of the mirror, and contem you know, contemplating age. <clears throat> um, so Carlton, uh, I, I don't know where you'd go except to Strauss. Uh, I've called Wagner the most successful musician of the second half of the 19th century and Strauss the most successful successful musician of the first half of the 20th century. And I don't think you can argue with those two comments, but I look forward to seeing you, I hope, Carlton, uh, soon. Great, well, thank you, Jim. That was great. Um, uh, any parting words for us, Jim, before we, we finish for the night? Stay safe, uh, stay healthy. This will all come to pass. We're suffering now, but uh, we'll be better for it, and uh, very good days lie ahead, and I look forward to sharing them with all of you, and I appreciate all of you who took the time to be with me tonight. Thank you, Jim, and thank you all for coming tonight. Have a great night.